It's great to see you today. Right off the get-go, a couple things real quick that we just got to start with. First of all, shout out to our South Campus. Good morning. We uh, just got done celebrating around here. What a great launch you had last week. And so we're just excited that you are with us today. And uh, God has got great things in store for South Campus. If you believe that, say amen real loud here so they'll hear it in this microphone. All right, hope you caught that down there. Second thing I want to say uh, to you is this. I want to mention to you that we are about to launch into a brand new ministry opportunity across the world, and we're about to dip our toes into a relationship, a missions relationship with the nation of Cuba. And I'm excited to mention to you we're going to be taking a mission trip to Cuba August 16th to 24th, would love to have you consider going with us down to Cuba. We'll be working with a youth conference down there, meeting with various key Wesleyan pastors, developing and strategizing, getting a game plan for what God's going to do in Cuba through the Wesleyan Church and what he might do through real life Wesleyan Church in Cuba. If you've never gone with us on a mission trip, I would encourage you to consider going. Now, I do need to tell you, because of the nature of this particular trip, it's uh, 19 years old and up, so uh, we often take teens with us. Not this particular trip will not be. In the future, we may into Cuba, but this time, 19 and up, and we can only take eight. I'm planning to go. We're down to seven, all right? And so if you're interested in going, the information is in your bulletin at both campuses. At both campuses, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer, and uh, if you want to just stay in the loop, signing up doesn't mean you're promising to go. But if you want to be kept in the loop informationally about joining us on this trip this August, put your name on the information sheet and uh, you can join us if you so choose to as we invest our lives in the kingdom of God through what he's going to do through us in Cuba. And so I use that term very intentionally because that's where we begin today. We've been talking about thriving and I want us to talk today about the I in Thrive, which stands for what? Read it with me off the screen. Yeah. Invest. That's right. If we are going to thrive, we're going to have to have a mentality of an investor. Let me explain to you what I mean. Buried deep in the news this week was an oh-so-important article. Once a year, there is published the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist, it was published this week. They are the ones who tell us where the hand is at on the doomsday clock. Did you see this? They moved us two minutes closer to midnight. So it is now 11.57 p.m. on the doomsday clock. So if you're the sky is falling kind of person, that's your kind of article. But I have to tell you, I'm not sure how to look at that article relative to this series. Because I've been telling you that I believe that for the children of God, his plan for our lives is that we are to thrive. And I happen to believe that Christians ought to be the greatest optimists in the world. If you agree with me, say amen. amen. Christians ought to be the greatest optimists in the world. Because the Bible verses that we read today say this, we should think like investors who recognize that as we give our lives today, there are things that God does through that tomorrow. And so we come to believe that if we use our lives wisely, we stop saying, oh no, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and instead we say, God, what do you want me to do today, believing that the kingdom of God is going to do great things, not just today, but tomorrow. Does that make sense? That's how we invest. You see, it's too easy to get into a negative mentality that begins to say, oh no, everything's going wrong. Is there really a hope and a future? But instead, we need to be a people who believe God has great plans, not only for our future, but wants to use us in his plans for the future all around. And so you begin to think about life as an investment. Let me ask it this way, maybe it'll help you. What kind of returns 
are you getting on the investment of your life? What kind of returns are you getting on the investment of your life? And you say, well, Pastor Todd, what do you mean by the expression, the investment of your life? Well, let me explain it to you this way. Every day when you wake up in the morning, God deposits into the bank of your life, doesn't he? He gives you 1,440 more minutes. He deposits them there for you. Now, I know this is a weekend, so some of those you slept away, and so did I. Maybe a few more than you do during a weekday, but he deposited 1,440 minutes into the bank of your life. He gave you a certain level of strength today. He gave you a certain level of health today. He gave you an awful lot of good looks today, right? Come on, turn to the person next to you and say, you know that's right. And the biblical question that was read to you by the pastor is this. What are you doing with what you've been given? How are you investing your life? I mean, let's face it. There is some kind of return in everything we choose to do. If you invest your time in going to school and studying. Come on, kids, listen to me. College kids, listen to me. I'm about to give you some great news. You invest your time going to school and studying and doing your homework. Do you know what's going to happen? Eventually, you receive a return. And the return is knowledge, intelligence, capacity, future opportunities. Mom and dad are happy with the report card. It's the return of the investment. We invest in food, don't we? I look at you, it looks like you do. <laughs> you look at me, it looks like we invest in food every day. We buy some food and we, and we eat the food as part of what we do. Why? Because we want to have strength and we want storage, right? In case a dark winter night come along, I've got some stored up there. We invest in exercise. What happens? We gain in the building of muscle or we gain in endurance. We put energy into relationships, and the result of that is love, it's friendship, it's intimacy, it's understanding. And so what Jesus says is this. When you look at your life through the lens of how God is seeing it, what are you storing up? What are you investing in? What kind of return are you going to get for your investment. Now, I want to keep this very simple today, so we're only going to talk about two aspects because I believe with these two words, I can sum up every kind of life investment. How are you investing your time, and how are you investing your money? Now, let me explain to you. Every time I refer to time today, I'm including in that the time you've been given on this earth, so your health your efforts that you put in with people, your thoughtfulness when you sit and and think about what can I do to make a difference in someone's life or what am I going to do with my time, your creativity, your volunteerism, the way you serve, all that will cover in the word time. How do you invest your time? And then money. Reference to money will mean everything that is a tangible resource of ours, your car and your home and your tools, the things that money can buy, and then your actual bank accounts, your actual money, your cash, your savings account. What are you doing with those things? Because Jesus asks the question, and I want you to know, God wants you to thrive and to really thrive in ways that matter. You've got to be willing to invest in things that matter. So let me show you three parts of the investment strategy of God. The first one is this, wise investment. Say that out loud with me, wise investment. Jesus doesn't mince any words. He says it this way, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. He goes on to explain it this way. It would be foolish of us to have a mentality about resources that only thinks about ourselves 
relative to our resources. It's spiritually blind to store up in such a way in which we think of ourselves as the sole storehouse that matters. That that is foolishness. And rather, it is wisdom to understand there is a way to invest our time. There is a way to invest our money in such a way that that investment pays good dividends. That the return is worthwhile. Because hear me, our true relationship with God is revealed by what we do with our resources. That's not the only way that our relationship with God is revealed. But our relationship with God will be revealed and can be understood when we consider what am I doing with the resources of my life. For example, we can try to be concerned only about ourselves in such a way that we say, I use my resources to keep me safe and to keep me happy. That's what I use my time and my money for so that I feel secure, so that I get whatever I want, so that I am satisfied, and I'm watching out for myself only. You know what Jesus said about that in this passage? He said, that's foolish. And you know why he said it's foolish? Because he says, that misunderstands this reality. God is the provider of all of your resources. Our safety and our security and ultimately our joy comes through him, not through the resource itself. And so he illustrates this through what I call a reverse illustration. I think a direct illustration of that foolishness would be for him to say, a man once had a billion dollars and he lost it all. That would be a direct illustration. But Jesus uses what I call a reverse illustration. He says it this way. I know some birds out there that ain't got nothing. I know some birds that never eat at Chick-fil-A or Outback Steakhouse. And they're well-fed. They have nothing stored up. They don't own a refrigerator. But every day they eat. See what I'm saying? God's their source and their resource. And those birds don't sit around worrying about it. He just provides. He says, you know what? I know some flowers that never shop at Kohl's or at Macy's or at any of those expensive. Have you ever noticed that you can go to malls and the fancier malls get, the less you even know the names of those stores? You know at the really expensive malls when, like, they're too fancy for Macy's, you're at the really expensive mall. And they don't have cards to any of those stores, and they don't own Visa cards. He says, I know flowers that don't know how to knit their own sweaters. But they look better than the Kardashians on red carpet. <laughs> That's not even hard, is it? <laughs> not only are they better dressed, they have moron than they do, probably. <laughs> Pastor Todd, did you just say moron? <laughs> the point is this. It's short-sighted and ignorant to think about resources in such a way that all of our energies are thrusted inward. Rather, we say, wise investment says, okay, God, help me to think about the things of this world and the time you've given me the way you would think about them without fear and without selfishness. Make me a wise investor. Now, the point here is not that it is evil for us to think about earthly investments as far as that we need to save up money for retirement. In fact, there are many Bible passages that says it's wise to do that. It's not evil to think, you know what, I'm trying to save up some money to help my kids get to college or, or something like that. The point is not that that is evil. The point is we don't do that things out of position of fear or selfishness. And so that helps us to keep the balance of being wise investors. It's like getting to a bigger mindset than most of the world around us has. <laughs> Look how Jesus said it. 
These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. And people all over the world have this mindset. More will make me happy. More will be better. In fact, let's, let's, let's just call it what it is. That small-minded mindset is one of the reasons why credit cards are so popular. Because the idea that at any given moment, I can have what I want, when I want, simply because I want it, is an idea that thrills our heart. We say, that's the kind of money that's fun. And then we get ourselves in trouble. And now that's kind of debt that makes us fret is what really happens. It's that kind of small-minded thinking that probably has some of us in trouble in this room today. Because somehow we believe that that resource is the source of happiness for us. You know, they did a study on how much do you need to be happy. They learned something so interesting, and people have pulled so many varying things from this extensive study that they did in the last decade. But the interesting thing that I found was this. Only 6% of the respondents flat out answered the question like this. There's no direct correlation between how much and happiness. Only 6% said that. 94% of the people said this. Happiness is right out there. The interesting thing is the dollar amount didn't matter. In other words, there were people making $30,000 a year who said, they didn't necessarily say, I'm unhappy. But what they said was this, I really think if only I was making 50, if I was making 50K a year, I think there's a level of happiness I would go to that I don't have currently at 30,000. They found that out. They found out that people were making 50, said if only I was making maybe 100. That, that, there's, there's some kind of happiness level that's out there beyond what I currently have. You know what? Then the 100 people say 250, and the 250 people, they say 500. Do you see the confusion? The confusion is the belief that the resource is the happiness. And so everything that we do and everything that we spend and every way we think about money is all about one sole storehouse. It's me. It's us. It's my family. That's not wise investing. God has a better idea than that for us. Wise investing says this. Now get this. Maybe, just maybe, every minute of this life that I was given is not just for me alone. Wise investing says, maybe, just maybe, every dollar that I've been given is not just for me alone. And so a wise investment begins to ask this question. How can I think about my resources in a way that there will be a return that lasts? Let's say it this way. How can I look at the resources of my life today and make them last beyond the day of my own funeral. That's wise investing. Well, the answer to that question is the second point, and it's this. It's kingdom investment. It's kingdom investment. This is the term Jesus uses. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. He'll give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. I love this. I never even saw this divine exchange before as many times as I have looked at this, which, by the way, is another reason why every single one of us ought to read God's word. That was a weak amen. <laughs> South, I hope you outdo Mechanicsville on this. That's one of the reasons we ought to read God's word. Because he speaks to our heart as we look into it. I never saw this before, this wonderful exchange that takes place. Here's what Jesus says. You seek first his kingdom. You invest your life and your money with him in mind. And when you do that, he says, guess what? I'll give you the keys to the car of the kingdom. I'll let you drive. I'll let you participate. 
and be in the middle of the work that I am doing. And you know what he says? It gives God great pleasure to do that. In other words, God looks at you and me and says, if you will think of it this way, that you are investing yourself in my kingdom, I'm going to give you the great blessing of letting you do that very thing and participate with me in this eternal work. You see, I hope it's not a secret today that the kingdom of God is reliant upon the investment of people who say what we do around here really matters. A people who are so sold on that. I, I have to tell you something. I'm going off script, so here we go. They've researched it again and again and again and again. It's true almost universally. It's called the 80-20 principle, and it goes like this. The financial and the time investment that makes a church go forward and impact the world, 80% of everything a church is able to do is a result of the giving of the time and money of 20% of the people in that church. It's the way the statistics work. Church after church after church. Even effective churches run into the 80-20 principle. I'm scratching my head asking myself, what would happen to a church if we even just flipped that so that we had 80% of the people excited about what was happening? That 20 would just disappear. I don't mean 20% of the people. I mean all the worries about the rest. If even just 8 out of 10 people said, what am I supposed to be giving in my funds? What am I supposed to be doing to help this church go forward? Let me tell you something. You'd have to bring your own seatbelt because you'd have to buckle in. Our bulletin would be 18 pages long. We'd be impacting, we'd be impacting the financial circumstances of people all over the area with what we'd be able to do. Does that excite anybody but me? Does that thing excite only pastors? It don't excite all of us. Because it's the belief that it matters that we invest. This church can't operate if you aren't willing to give of yourselves, to participate, and to be a part in it. If you're not convinced yet, we just cranked up a little video that will maybe convince you even more. So... Take a look here on the screens. Rob, if we can dim these lights a little bit, it might help. But let's, let's take a look on the screen. Good morning. Welcome to Real Life. You're welcome to take your coat off. Come on in. Let me help you find your seat. Well, good morning. Welcome to Real Life. So glad that you're here. We've got a really cool event coming up we want you to be a part of. Take a look at the screen. Video clip. Go. Don't forget to put your guest slip in the plate as well. I think this recording is going great. Pastor Todd looks so good today. So God's word is really clear on this. My mic sounds a little loud. Can you hold on just a second? Ah, let's get that just, ah, that sounds better. All right, that should be better. Tyler, let's go. Tyler, what are you doing, dude? Shane, Shane, thank you, there were so many kids. and. And there was one of me. Oh, oh it was a nightmare. No. Hey, welcome to Elevate. As you can see, I'm prepping for snack shop. We got worship on the boom box. And I got some games. Are you ready, Bill? I'm ready, Bill. Are you ready? 
I'm ready, Bill. How about you, Bill? I'm ready, Bill. How about you? I'm ready, Bill. I'm ready to rock. Save us from that fate, would you please? I would appreciate that so much. Kingdom investments are faith investments. In other words, as we give of ourselves, we are confident that his word is true and they make a difference, even though we don't always see it immediately. Even though we can't always gauge it in some practical or measurable way immediately when it happens, the entire Christian walk is a walk by faith. We talked about that last weekend. And so now we say, you know what? I give by faith of my time and my money. And God, you're going to bless it. And you're going to do with it what you want to do with it. And you're going to make a difference in someone's life. And we just jump in and we say, I'm going to do that and believe that God's going to be good to his word. And this investment is going to be worth it because it's a kingdom investment. And so we jump in and we do it. Just a few weeks ago, I got some news that to me was personally very sad. I discovered that the church that I had grown up in, in Rochester, New York, was closing. They were closing it down for lack of interest, and they were selling the building. I was with some people who had some knowledge of where some of those people are today and what's going on in their lives, and so I was talking to them about that and what was happening, and I was reminiscing with them back to those early days. You see, when I was in my senior year of high school, really I was working full-time and just finishing up one last class, we did not have a youth pastor that year. We had come through a wonderful youth pastor who meant so much to me, and he went on his way, and we hadn't gotten another one yet, and so our, our teen group was kind of just languishing, and since I was a senior, some people came and said, you know, Todd, why don't you just try to gather some things together and, and give us some kind of leadership at least? So I said, I'll do what I can, so on Sunday evenings, while the adults would come and do worship service, I started this little program, and we would get 10, 12, 14, sometimes maybe 15, 16 kids. A lot of them were junior hires, and we'd come together, and we'd play some games, and then I would teach some kind of Bible story or, or give a devotional. And the way I got them there was this. I said, listen, after that excellent teaching that I'm going to do, we will uh, go get pizza. So that was our standard. And so I basically bribed kids to come to church. And so I'd say, come and we'll go get pizza. And my parents would let me use our big old van. And I would load all those teenagers up. And we would go down to the local pizza hut. That was our hangout every Sunday night. And so all these junior hires, they would go to their mom and dad and say, hey, I'm going to go to Pizza Hut with Todd. Can I have some money? And so they'd hand them out $2 or $3, and they would go. Because back in those days, 2 or $3 could get it done. Well, almost. Because we'd get there, and here's 15 of us, you know, all getting pizza and all these junior hires. And they'd throw in their $2 and these $2 and these $2. And they would put it all together. You know what? It was never quite enough. It was kind of, sort of, almost enough. And so it never failed because a seventh grader doesn't understand the meaning of the word tip, right? They think that means something fell over. And so without fail, I would end up not only burning gas to get them all there and deliver them all back to the church, but I would end up having to throw in 20 or 25 bucks. Now, I got to tell you something. That's a big deal to a guy who was working full time, saving for college and making probably eight bucks an hour at the time. And I remember one time I said to my dad, Dad, I don't know what to think about this. I, every week I'm ending up throwing in money for all of this. He said, Todd, you know what? God's given you an opportunity to lead. He said, I know it's an investment right now, but you never know what a difference it's making. And I know it's tough, but you'll, you'll make it through all right. So I kept doing that. Remember I told you I was with that person recently who told me how, how Trinity was closing down. They also knew something about a lot of the kids that had been those junior hires when I was there. Do you know what I learned? I learned one young man, he's now a chemist in, uh, in, up in New Hampshire, serving the Lord, key man in his church, got a beautiful little girl. 
God's using him there in that church. Another young man who used to come out and go to pizza, he lives down in Richmond. He's, a, he's an officer down there in the police force, key man in his church, multiple children, serving the Lord, honoring God. One young lady who was a good friend of mine used to go out every week and claim that because she was the other oldest one with me, she got the seat right up there in the front. That young lady, she's up here in northern part of Maryland, and though many of her brothers and sisters aren't serving God today, she is, and raising a family with her husband for Christ. Can I tell you something? No way can I take sole claim for what God has done in those people's lives, but I can tell you something. I can say this. I invested in it. And what God is doing in their lives is part of my return. I get to look back and say all those times I pitched in all that extra money and said, oh, that I'm a part of the good things that God do, is doing in their life today. We don't always get to see it. We don't always know, but we invest. And let me give you this key investment principle. It is this. Kingdom investment runs on different math than world's investment does. Here's what I mean by that. God challenges us and says, you know, the baseline I would love to see you give is 10%. To trust me with a tithe, 10% up front. And for some of us, that might be $50 out of a $500 a week paycheck. For some of us, that might be $500 out of a $5,000 a week paycheck. But you know what? The call is the same to each of us. It's a call to faithfulness. And if we will be faithful, then he will bless it, and he will give us the return. Some of us might say, I've got an ability to sing, and so you come up here, and you're in a position where there's lots of recognition, and people see you. Oh, I know you serve in real life because I, I see you up there singing, and other of you, you can't sing at all. Thank you for staying where you're at and not scaring people off from here. <laughs> and you can't sing. But you have a position that a lot less people see what you do. A lot less people maybe thank you for it on a regular basis. But it matters just as much. And God sees it just as much. And he doesn't miss a thing of what you are doing for him. And so maybe sometimes the pastor remembers to say thank you. Maybe sometimes he doesn't. But it matters all the same. Just a few weeks ago, we gathered a bunch of you in. All we could do to say thank you was for me to stand and tell you how important it is what you do. And then, oh yeah, we handed you a $20 Chick-fil-A card as a tangible way to say thanks. If you're a volunteer in this church and you were thinking about coming that night and you missed, sorry about your luck. <laughs> but the good news is, we're going to do this again sometime soon. Come on out. Who knows what we're giving away? I think Pastor Shane's giving his car away that night. So come be a part of that. <laughs> Whatever it is, what you can do, what you can give, you give it for the glory of God, and God doesn't miss it. Well, here's the last principle. We'll go on our way. It's a lasting investment. A lasting investment. Sell your possessions and give to those in need, because this will store up treasures for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Can I tell you something? There's no such thing as a container here that doesn't get old at some point. There's no such thing as storage around here that doesn't wear out at some point. Today I was at, um, down at, at uh, BJ's with my son and I saw these really cool looking wallets and uh, it was the same color. I don't know why I carry a brown wallet, but I just like that color. And I almost bought myself a new wallet, but I decided there weren't enough tatters and tears in my current wallet yet to excuse it, so I was going to hang on a little bit longer. But you know what? Someday this old wallet will give up, and I'll buy a new wallet, and someday that wallet will give up. Because I can tell you something. When we talk about earthly investment, there is no such thing as a sure thing. You hear me? No such thing as a sure thing that can never go wrong. It just doesn't exist in earthly investments. Nothing lasts forever. My parents had the choice in life between having kids or having money. We all have those choices, don't we? <laughs> they chose kids. They raised six boys. 
They, they. <laughs> I'll, I'll let my mom know you groaned. I'll tell her you felt her pain tonight when I speak to her. But we knew what it was like to have to stretch. We used to take that can of frozen concentrate that says add three cups of water. We used to add six and drink that. It had a flavor that somehow reminded you of orange juice somewhere along the way. Well, I'll never forget, when I was about 17 years old, kind of a similar time frame to the other story that I told you, one day I went in, and it was in the evening. I saw my dad. He was pouring over some investment magazines and things like that. And I said, Dad, what are you doing? Now, my dad's a man of great wisdom when it comes to money. He served as the corporate controller for Wegmans food markets for many years through some of their greatest years of growth. Dad said, Todd, you know I haven't been able to give any money towards your older brother's education. He says, I'll probably never be able to give any towards yours, but maybe, just maybe. He said, I've been setting some money aside for about four or five years now. He said, and I've been thinking about making some kind of investment that might have a pretty quick turnaround. He said, maybe I can help you a little with college. I can help your younger brothers with college. Maybe put a little aside for mom and me a little more towards our retirement. I said, what are you thinking about investing in? So he said, you're old enough. I can tell you about it. So I sat down. He said, I've been researching this startup company. This was the late 80s. He said, I've been researching this startup company. He says, I have spoken to them on the phone. I've interviewed them. He says, I've looked at a lot of their credentials. It's, it's, it's a, got a solid business plan. And he said, it's, it's, it has to do with oil exploration. And he said, here's, here's the way it works. He says, I'm going to give them $20,000. He said, they're, go, they're about to start drilling wells. He said, if they can hit on two out of 11, the company is a go. Two out of 11, it's a go, and they will turn a profit, and I'll begin in time to get dividends from my investment. He says, I, I believe it's a solid investment. I'm so going to go for it. So we went for it. About three months later, there was a tremendous political back and forth that went between the United States and Russia, and the Middle East got involved. And before you knew it, things deregulated. We opened up a lot more oil here in the U.S., and the price of oil plummeted, just like we're going through right now. The price of oil plummeted. It had been 70 some dollars a gallon back in the worst, worst times. It dropped down into the low 20s. The big oil companies, they were big enough to ride it out and survive it. But that little startup company out there drilling their little 11 wells, poof, gone. And my dad said to me later, well, I'm a great investor. I can turn $20,000 into zero faster than anybody I know. It wasn't that my dad was foolish. He was a shrewd businessman. Here's the reality, folks. There's no such thing as a sure thing. Everything at some point fails and falters. And so you know what? I paid for my own college, and I don't mind, and I've taught my kids not to mind when they pay for theirs either. And somebody said amen in the room. <laughs> but I want you to know something. There may be no sure thing here on earth, but there is a sure thing in eternity. Because there are vaults that do not wear out and purses that do not gain hold, and there are places where you can put your investment where it will never rust. Invest in God's kingdom. It's a sure thing. And let me tell you something. Every time you give your time in that children's wing, every time you come in here and sit in this foyer and smile and be kind to someone who walks in and is looking for some bread and you hand them some peanut butter and some jelly and say, take as much bread as you need. We've got bunches and bunches. And every time you stay late and clean up behind some event and every time you open up your house again on that Tuesday night and vacuum it so that life group can come over. You can fool them into believing that your house is always clean. <laughs> Come on, we all play the game. <laughs> and every time you put in that kind of effort, God sees it, and he marks it into your bank account. And every time you give faithfully, so that we can do something around here that tells one more person about Jesus. And every time you give some money so that we can buy another stick of glue. 
And every time you give in one of those offerings at the end of our communion time so that we can help somebody go down and fill their tank with gas or get some groceries who's struggling to get groceries or buy a medicine they were about to go without that they really can't go without. Every time you give like that, God marks it down in your eternal bank account. And it's not going away. It's an investment with a return. It's a lasting investment. Let me tell you, when we do that, there's something special that happens here that binds our heart to his work that much more. You see, I want you to catch this. The scripture text does not say where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be also. Now, that's a true sentence. If your heart is given to something, you'll put your treasure behind it. I mean, my... My heart is is near to my family, and boy, do I put treasure behind it, right? You do. It's self-evident. Where your heart is, your treasure will be. This passage says that Jesus says where your treasure is, that's where your heart's desire will be. You see, when we step out in faith and invest ourselves, and we give our time, and we pour out our funds, and we say, you know what, I'm a part of this, he's going to bless you in such a way that draws your heart to it, that begins to create a desire inside of you that says, isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome what happened? Isn't that neat to know that God's doing something eternal even when I don't see it yet? It's a lasting investment. Some of you have heard the name of the company Enron. It was a massive company, an extraordinarily profitable company. In 2001, Enron alone brought in $11 billion of income. For six years running, Fortune 500 named them America's most innovative company. Every stockbroker. Every mutual fund manager would have said in 2001, good idea, invest in Enron. But the story has no shock value tonight to you because you know the rest of the story. They are now the poster child. They are the name we equate with dishonest business practice. You see, they were cooking the books. On top of that, Arthur Anderson, the company that was supposed to be auditing them, wasn't even auditing them right. And before it was all said and done, Arthur Anderson went out of business, and Enron went out of business. And I want you to know something. In 2001, if you invested a million dollars in Enron, in 2004, do you know what you had to show for it? Zero. Because no investment on this earth is a sure thing. But I want you to know something. When we place our hope and invest our lives in that which is eternal, it never wears out. Everything else eventually rusts, tatters, spoils, dissolves, wears out, becomes obsolete, or just tires out and falls down. But not that which goes for his kingdom. Every dollar, every minute you have ever given will result in the blessings of God and a return on your investment.